Hi, everyone. And you know, GrooveShark is actually one of the first tabs that I have loaded on, on my browser whenever I come in in the morning. And it's a default for me. Um, so my name's Jonathan LeBlanc. I lead developer evangelism in North America at PayPal. It's usually a lot of conference going and really just promoting the products amongst uh, startups and developers and helping them through basically anything commerce related. So we'll travel quite a lot and speak with uh, other developers in the, in the industry and see what's, what's wrong with our products, what's good with our products, and how to improve them. Now, what I thought would be really interesting tonight is instead of going through a product architecture, talk to you about some of the biggest challenges that we have working with developers. These have been the, some of the most challenging use cases that I've gone through in my career at PayPal, and definitely some of the most the most challenging that, um, that a lot of the industry has gone through because we've seen a massive shift in the industry from mass modal, mobile development to different types of commerce platforms. So these are the things that we're gonna go through and at the end, for those of you who stay to the end, I have a really, really special announcement for all the developers who, are, who build on top of PayPal products. We have some really cool new projects that are coming out and I'll walk you through some of those. So, no matter what realm that you're working with in, in the developer sphere, if you're working with, let's say, the traditional offline methodologies, if you're working with, with an actual brick and mortar store, if you're working with physical goods, these are elements of the commerce life cycle that we tend to work with. And when you start to add in digital products, in the case of music, music retention or uh, online digital goods or, or buying those goods, you start to blur the lines in commerce. So commerce now, what we are seeing in the last couple of years is that there's no new division against these offline and online methodologies. They're completely blurring through everything that we're doing, all development that we're doing. So everything that you're seeing coming from, from PayPal and from a lot of the companies out there are mixing these lines. You know, even going further, when a lot of the startups that I'm working na with nowadays, they don't, buy, they don't sell products in the traditional way. They sell data. So we're seeing a mass industry shift towards people aggregating data from everything that they're doing on a, on a regular basis and utilizing that, that anonymous data, in order to provide value for companies. We'll take a look at some of those use cases as well. And then finally, a lot of my career is built off these mechanisms of personalization and identity. One of the really, really cool spaces that we're getting into nowadays as an entire world is that everything that we're doing online is no longer flat. It's completely personalized to our experiences. All this data that's coming from these realms, all these buying habits that we, uh, that we have as we're going online, all give us these great mechanisms to personalize. And these are some really interesting industries that's, that are springing up, that we're seeing, spring, seeing springing up in every country around the world. So to start things off, I figured I'd talk about digital because they seem, seem to come up quite often. It's a, it's a conversation that is very difficult to have at times because they're such a new industry and, and really working with digital products as I'm sure you, you know, is, it can be quite difficult at times. You're working with a good that someone, it, that's intangible, really, that someone is buying online, but it has no, no physical presence. You're essentially selling data. But when we take a look at the reasons behind moving into that industry, we just look at the comparison between physical goods and digital goods. So in the physical landscape, what you're dealing with is a lot of overhead. So if you are selling physical goods, if you have uh, an actual tangible product that you're working with, something you can hold, you have a lot of costs that are incurred by your business. So the product that you're selling for, uh, for let's say 100, 200 pesos, it, you know, that's just the overall amount and then you start subtracting all these costs. But when you start looking at digital products, it's data. You don't have those traditional costs. You might, in the case of mu in the music industry, or where you have royalties to pay, you'll pay out that. But when you have digital, new digital products, things that, that enable a digital marketplace, these are all free and clear. You're working with just data that you can store, which means all that money comes directly into your business and allows you to grow at a significantly faster rate. 
So one of the companies that I've worked with um, in, in the past, um, they're a 500 startups company. So, and they're the, probably the most significant integration of digital products that I've seen in a while. What they were doing was building a digital marketplace for people to host their digital goods. So, so something like um, a digital, a digital uh, artwork or uh, custom music that they make, or et cetera, et cetera. Anything digital related you could sell to other people because you have the royalties. Now, when we were lo looking at their architecture, they were looking at PayPal and weren't really sure what products that they should use. And eventually, working with their architecture, we worked them down a line of, of using Express Checkout with a digital goods flow. So instead of a full page redirect, you would do something like a little light box that would pop up. It's a really good experience for, uh, for, modal win uh, for mobile windows or for, for the web experience because you're not leaving the context of the site. But the challenge, they've run into a lot of challenges over, over the six months that I've been working with them. And they are a perfect epitome of what digital goods are. And their company name is Instamojo. So some of the problems that you're going to run into with this type of methodology is in chargebacks and fraud. So chargebacks come from people who say that hey, the good that I received, the digital product, isn't as, as described. It's not what I wanted. Or, hey, my, I, I, my credit card got stolen and got, it got used. Issues of chargeback like that and, and fraud mechanisms where people are, are stealing credit cards are exactly where the, the risk management aspects that's, that's great about PayPal. But also, when you're working in that industry, you have to be aware of those. And there's a lot of things that you can do to, to mitigate these concerns so that when you have chargebacks, where you have disputes coming on your products, you actually have a realm to say, yes, you actually did buy this product and I can prove it. It's not like you're sending a physical item to someone, right? They're just buying something online. You have to have new ways of tracking users. Then they ran into copyright concerns. Because obviously, if you have a platform that's built on people selling their own copyrighted material, they have to provide something that's owned by them. But you'll see people that are uploading music by famous artists and trying to sell that. Well, they obviously can't do that, so copyright concerns are always, a con are always an issue. And then tracking users. I've mentioned this once, and this is probably the biggest problem within the digital, or digital realm, but there's tons of stuff that we can do around it. And, and really, when you're working in this type of industry, it comes down to being aware of what you're doing and how to work with those ty this type of industry because it's completely different than how commerce has always been. So as you're tracking buyers, there's things that you can do. You can do IP to, address, uh, to um, physical address location. So as the person's checking out, they'll have a billing address uh, or something that's tied in with their PayPal account. You can tie that back to their IP address and, tie, and see if it overlaps. Now, obviously, this isn't 100% accurate because you'll have Wi-Fi locations that might not be in the same country, but it's a good indicator. It's one little indicator that you can use, but you cannot rely on this. Things like email domain, domain type, matching email domains of, of what they're checking out with, with PayPal, uh, to actually what they're inputting as their email address, where the, the good might be delivered. So email domain checking is another mechanism. User browsing and buying habits. This is really where everything is going in the industry. Because all of this data that you're storing about people as they're using your products give you an amazing mechanism for personalizing the entire experience. Not just personalizing, but knowing exactly what type of person they are, what they're buying, what they're interested in. This is the, the basis for building out a recommendation system that's personalized to a user and a completely personalized experience. Now, in the case of Instamojo and a lot of the other uh, uh, digital companies out there, they've opted for doing manual reviews. So obviously, in, when you're in a startup realm, every dollar counts. You're a bootstrap startup that has next to no mo money. You're living off of, uh, off of noodles for your entire, uh, for entire three months. But, when you're working with, uh, with the reviews, this is a good way of catching fraud as you're going through from a small scale. So they've opted for actually going through and manually reviewing the, the money that's coming in. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with risk management systems like what PayPal has, 
it handles a lot of these cases. In the case of Instamojo, uh, about a week ago, what happened was there, a, a portion of their funds got locked within PayPal. What happened when, when they did some discovery and when they went through manual review is that they had a, a case of potential fraud. Someone was selling a virus scanning service on their platform, which is an indicator within PayPal of potential fraud because that's used quite a lot. A lot. So the funds got locked down to prevent the fraud. Now, obviously, they were thinking, oh, why are my funds getting locked? Well, it was specifically to prevent them from losing money. That's why risk management is so important, and definitely so important in this. And then let's get into the really fun stuff, device fingerprinting. Actually being able to determine who buys a product based on the laptop that they're using, based on the computer that they're using, based on the device that they're using. This is really cool because you can get bits of identifying information. So this site right here is a really cool new site that I, that I had found. It's been around for a while. But these indicators here are all based off my laptop. So these are determining characteristics of who I am and what I have installed. So utilizing mechanisms like, uh, like my browser plugin details or my time zone, you can actually determine how, uh, how many other computers in the entire world uh, on the internet actually share those characteristics. So in the case of my time zone, for instance, there are tw over 21.6 bits of identifiable information about me, about my time zone, my locale, all the details about me. Well, only one in 3,178,409 people share that exact time zone detail. Amazing indicator for actually tracking back to a user. The same details with, uh, are available within cookies or system fonts. That's a really good one because the more system fonts you have, the, uh, the higher this, this drills down. Now, each piece of this information in and of the, themselves might not be core identifiable detail to a, a specific user, but add all of these up and you're getting an indicator that's maybe one or two people in the entire world. And that's how you protect yourself from chargebacks and frauds. As people are going through disputes and saying, no, it wasn't me that purchased this. Someone stole my credit card or someone used my credit card. You have characteristics that you can determine saying, yes, it was you. And we can determine it because also the product that you bought meets the characteristics of the things you bought in the past. These are amazing details that you can use for digital goods. And this is why this industry is booming so big. Now next, this is a huge one in a lot of the PayPal efforts within Mexico, is the, the push for mobile. So in the, in the US, for instance, mobile is a, um, a different experience. But you know, from everything that I've seen o over here, it, it's a primary citizen. It's, it's what a lot of people used to get online. And this is a big push for PayPal as an overall company mechanism because we're seeing massive growth in the mobile industry, obviously. This has been happening for years. But when working with the mobile, uh, mobile industry, there are a lot of things to be aware of, a lot of things that you're going to be working with. And every single conference I get to, I always get asked about app stores. So can we use PayPal to bypass the iOS app store and not pay 30%? every single conference I get asked that question. Because who wants to pay 30% of their profits, right? No one. Well, you know, unfortunately, when you're working with app stores, when you're working with Google Marketplaces, when you're working with something um, like an app store where they can actually sell those digital products, you have to work within the limits of those app stores. You have to go through their app store because your app won't get through. There are ways, uh, ways to work with this, and there are ways to make it easier on you, but this is a simple fact of these app stores. Then, when you're working with physical goods, that's perfectly fine. You pop up a web view in iOS, Android, whatever smartphone you're using, and you can do the purchasing right through PayPal. But it's this digital goods concern that we're really working with. Now, that's why PayPal has started bridging into wrappers on top of the entire App Store experience. So one of the, one of the new projects that I've been working with, uh, with the group on is called Payments Hub. What Payments Hub is, is a way of wrapping 
essentially every app store or, or purchasing experience that you're going to go through. So if it's iOS App Store, the Android Marketplace, uh, you know, Blackberry, if you're going on a web experience, it wraps that. So the way that it works is, let's say you're in a web experience. What's going to happen when you try to purchase a good is that you're going to be pushed through a PayPal experience. If you're on iOS, it's going to push you through the App Store experience. So it's an easy wrapper that's on top of all these mechanisms so that it, kind, it makes it easier for you to develop because you're still going to have that pain of 30% being taken out of your overall costs. But there are ways that companies have worked around this. So a lot of what I do is not in native development, it's in cross-platform development using HTML5. So enabling that purchasing experience on mobile through a mobile optimized experience. So these responsive sites, now this is a, uh, a buzzword that's used a lot. Have you guys used it a lot over here? Heard of it a lot? Responsive? Yeah, okay. I saw eye rolling. So yes, exactly how it, how it is every other place I go. Really, all this means is that you're building one code base to hit mobile, to hit web, to hit everywhere. It's a huge buzzword, just like cloud used to be. Yeah, so huge buzzword, but really all it means is a, a way of having both a mobile and web experience, right? So building this type of, type of experience has enabled a lot of companies to bypass these types of app stores. Then, reducing the actual number of, uh, number of screens that are put in front of users. What we, have no uh, what we have noticed in the mobile app experience is that when you're pushing users through, um, through two or three or screens, you're actually seeing a significant drop off. It's the reason why we've pushed a lot of our new identity products, which I'll tie in in a little bit, and, and made it so that you can have a one check a click flow as opposed to, let's say, a two checkout flow that you might be used to with the Express Checkout experience. It's an enhancement on top of a Express Checkout. This is what you want because we've seen almost an increase of 30% on every screen that you put in front of the user where they have to, f uh, where they have to actually fill out information. So a 30% drop off if you have to go through a registration page. 30% drop off if you have to enter in user details you might as well be working in the App Store. So this is where our identity systems come into play. A lot of the other work that I, that I started with within PayPal is a mechanism called Login with PayPal. Really what it is, is it's all built on open source technologies. So how many of you have worked with OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect in the past? Okay, uh, have any of you used Facebook Login before? Okay, it's, um, it's basically, or Google, or any of the Air APIs, basically every single API out there that's coming out is based off OAuth 2, with the exception of co some companies that are like Twitter that are based off OAuth 1. But OAuth 2 is a really simple way of, of uh, authorizing an application or logging in a user. That's what it's used for in dual, bo uh, dual purposes. So these same technologies have enabled us to enhance Express Checkout so that you have a one click checkout flow. You log in with your PayPal account, and that enables the merchant to grab concrete user details about you. So instead of using a social platform where I could be a dog online, I could be a cat online, or a baby, and, and that's the information that I'm pulling, instead of that, you're actually grabbing concrete, verified user information about a, about a person. And when you're going through a purchasing flow, this is exactly what you want. You want to see this experience where you can actually use the identity of the person. And that's where this has become a great boon for us. It's, it's made our lives a lot easier. So the same identity, identity mechanisms have, have enabled us to really see increases in our merchant's traffic. They've allowed us to do things like remove complexities. If I saw a form like that when I was checking out, I would be gone like that. And that's in a mobile experience, that's essentially what you're trying to do. With the identity initiatives, you're trying to remove complexities like this. Having a sign-in through a flow that uh, people, uh, people are familiar with, people trust, that's where you want to go. If you have a merchant experience, why would you leverage off of identity information that doesn't make sense? It ha social information has a good reach for building out accounts, uh, free accounts or something like that. But when it comes to this detail, this will drop users. Users will just leave. And that's essentially what you don't want. 
Then tying in all of those identity initiatives with buying information, tracking all the details about what a person is doing, allows you to enable things like personal re recommendations. Instead of just showing something like user A bought this product, but they also bought this product. This is all about personalizing. So every single person sees a complete different product architecture. They see new recommendation systems. This is the basis of personalization and identity. This is the basis of what I've built most of my career off of, is personalizing these experiences. And everything that the industry is moving to as a web experience, as, as, as a culture, as multiple cultures worldwide, is all about that. And the reason behind that is because of an uptake in sales. And so a lot of optimists have said that you can see a 30% increase in traffic if you show recommended products. Now, this is more realistic, around 20%, 15 to 20%, on simply knowing your product architecture, so your inventory. Now, when you personalize, that increases higher. So tying in these identity initiatives. And definitely within the mobile experience, you want to remove these complexities. So that's a lot of what we've seen coming out of the industry. This one has caused me no end of pain within, uh, when I've been working with companies that have, have been working in this type of industry, crowdfunding. You, now, are, are there are a lot of crowdfunding applications that have come up here, right? Uh, you're probably seeing things like Kickstarter. Uh, how many of you have funded a Kickstarter campaign in the past? Now, how many of you have actually got some reward from your Kickstarter campaign or just, have, have you all just lost money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's exactly why crowdfunding is hard. But there's also the flip side, which is group funding. A lot of the startups that I'm seeing coming out uh, are doing things like, like tab splitting. So you're at a restaurant and you have a whole bunch of friends. What they're trying to do is split the tab evenly and have each person pay to, to make the payment all at once. Crowdfunding is a completely different mechanism. So within crowdfunding, what you're essentially doing is you have a whole bunch of people that are funding one individual to do something. That might be to build something, it might be to put on an event, it could be anything. So essentially what your funnel looks like is a whole bunch of people, what to one person, to potentially a lot of people. Biggest problem with pay the payment industry and, and, and working with these types of models is that this, you cannot track this money all the way to the end. You can track the money to the, that person, but that's where it stops. So huge indicators for fraud or risk are, are available in this model. And the simple fact is, Kickstarter and maybe one other company out there are the only ones who have really made money off this model. But you have a lot of companies that are building on top of it and building innovative things on it. So I've fought a lot of fights internally to get these applications pushed out. So around, let's say, a year ago, um, when a lot of people were building crowdfunding applications, I had two companies that were coming to me saying, I want to build a crowdfunding application to essentially enable uh, a lot of people to fund a single person to put on an event. It might be a concert, it might be a play, it might be anything like that. So it's using this crowdfunding mechanism. Now, what was going on is that one of these companies was actually a medium-sized business which had some funding behind it. They have an appropriate model where they were tracking and verifying users that were, that were utilizing this. Um, and then they actually had funds that they were putting in to handle the case of chargebacks or, or credit card fraud, things like that. The other one, brand new bootstrap startup. They're the ramen crowd. They're living off noodles. They have no money. They're working with a funding model where you know, they want the, the end user to be responsible for all fraud. They, they, want, they, they essentially want no, no part in that fraud or those chargebacks. Um, but, but, they don't, uh, but they can't handle the chargebacks. So what happened was, within their model, within this startup model, they weren't able to get their application approved because they were just so incredibly risky because we couldn't verify those end users. We couldn't verify who was going on there. Uh, and and their, their model wasn't built out to be able to handle those chargebacks. And it's not to, really to protect PayPal. The case here is protecting the end consumers. The case here is to protect the startup. So let's say you have one campaign that goes through for an event. $100,000, $200,000 get pushed through. 
And what, what you might see is when those chargebacks all come through, then they, and they're all responsible for, for handling these chargebacks because that event coordinator just left, then their startup goes bankrupt. Their startup's gone. That's what we're trying to handle and not have the case of. The other, the other medium-sized business got pushed through because they were able to have the funding behind it. They were able to have this good model where they verified those end users and we could track the money all the way to the end. They protected themselves, they protected their consumers. And this is why crowdfunding is so hard because the, the, the model in and of itself is difficult because you're relying on so many unknowns, which are people. Now crowdfunding on the, or group funding on the other hand, you essentially just have a bunch of people that are enabling a, an end purchase or an end goal. So in this case, most of the time what you're seeing is a whole bunch of groups of people who know each other because they're funding, let's say, a group purchase for a gift or they're doing this tab splitting. So that's what group funding is. So when we get into the crowdfunding difficulties, the problems when we break them down are things like tracking the money to its final source or vetting project owners. You know, these are key indicators uh, for, for us when we're looking through it. And really for any payment platform that you're working on out there, most of them won't touch crowdfunding because it is so risky. Uh, we've been fighting this, this fight internally and I finally have a really good model for building these crowdfunding applications. And then things like targeting time to payment charge. You don't want to have, let's say, a person you know, authorizing a payment and then having them wait for three months because the credit card information and, and might not be valid at that point. The payments might, might not be valid. The authorization might not be valid. So everything under a month is very safe to work with. And then handling chargebacks. You essentially want to have the money or the vetting, uh, essentially you want to have the money in the account for the company or the, the vetted users, the vetted owners. And then on group funding, if we look at that, that's a completely different mechanism. You have to deal with, with things like short versus long-term money holding, just like with crowdfunding, but it's a little bit different because you're, you're doing it over the short term because it'll be things like tab splitting. It'll almost always be short term. Then you're doing things like, like uh, are you doing direct payments to a single person to buy a gift? Or are you funding, let's say, a merchant? Or are you funding a restaurant to push all that money into? These are things that, decisions that you have to make if you're building a group funding application. And then who's responsible for chargebacks and refunds? Well, in this case, it's actually pretty good because group funding, 99% of the cases I've seen are, be, be, are for people that know each other. So this really doesn't happen very often. So you don't have to worry too much about these chargebacks, but one key indicator, one key person has to be responsible for them. And then, just like with the personalization realm, the other key, this has been a really big industry as of late. People not selling anything physical, they're not selling anything digital, they're selling data. Oh, um, you guys don't have Target over here, right? But you have Walmart. Okay, so um, uh, just like Walmart's, we have Target in, uh, in the US and Canada. They're exactly like Walmart. Now, what's, uh, an interesting story came out a couple of years ago about Target. This teenage girl started, is starting getting these coupons from Target. And they were for baby goods. So uh, products like uh, um, you know, prenatal vitamins or, or um, uh, you know, diaper bags or things like that. So she was about 16, I believe. Her father saw this coupon, booklet, this coupon booklet and was furious with Target. Just absolutely ticked off that they would send her this over and over and over again. He said, my daughter's not pregnant. Why do you keep sending this? He goes to Target. He proceeds to yell at every single person in that store. And saying, my daughter's not pregnant. Why are you sending this information? He go, eventually goes home, talks to his daughter. Turns out his daughter is pregnant. <sighs> So that was an interesting conversation. But the real, f okay, so this is where we get into really cool at the same time as really creepy. What Target was doing was every single time she was purchasing something from Target, they were mining her information about what she was purchasing. So she was buying things like unscented lotion, vitamin supplements, di uh, bags, handbags that could double as diaper bags. The traditional things you would buy 
as you're pregnant. And they have a team of analysts behind there that are actually mining that information and give a determining factor of how likely it is that she's pregnant. Well, <laughs> that's kind of really creepy but amazing at the same time. Walmart does the exact same thing. Walmart has an entire division called Walmart Labs that does exactly that. This is where the data industry is going. This is where the brick and mortars, where, where the traditional storefronts are moving because they can make a lot of money off it. If you're sending these coupons to someone who needs pregnancy supplies, if they need prenatal vitamins, if they need uh, you know, diaper bags and diapers and food, who are they going to go to, an unknown or someone who just sent them a whole bunch of coupons for discounts? That's how they make money. I'm also an advisor with, with a lot of startups that, that have come through. One of the startups that I work with is called StopDat. They've just pushed out publicly. And really what they are is a way for you to check into sites, so websites that you go to. And as you check into websites, it's a way of curating your user information from a bunch of different social sites as well as your browsing habits. Now behind the scenes, what's happening is there's an entire data mining engine. And what it's doing is, based on the sites you check into, based on the time on site, it is actually building a personality profile for you. So after three, four sites, they can determine exactly what products that you're interested in. And from that, build out a recommendation system on top of that. So you can find and browse new things on the internet that you've never seen before. Now, it's a free service, but what they're doing behind the scenes is using that data platform to actually provide benefits to, to companies. So companies really want to know, people who go to my site, where else are they going to? What else are they interested in? Now this is all anonymous data, not tracked back to an individual user, but that's exactly what they're doing with data. And that's how they're benefiting off a monetization model that's different from everything else in the commerce sphere. But whenever I talk about data, because um, I work uh, with data mining quite a lot, um, built out a lot of data mining engines in the past, the problem is you're, well, not the problem, the, the thing is you're dealing with real people. You're not dealing with data. You're dealing with real people's information. Uh, developers tend to forget this at times. I, you know, I know when I was building out a data mining engine, I kept asking myself, ooh, I wonder if I can determine this about the person uh, based off this information. The answer was almost always yes. But the question should always be, just because I can do something, should I? So, when you're working with people's data, always push to an anonymity. An 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 anonymize all your data. And also, Use that data to personalize experiences, to build better sites for people, to build better services, as opposed to abusing it and just providing openly people's information. These are the basis for, for the entire identity industry. This was the mechanism, the, the, the spirit behind login with PayPal, providing an identity platform of raw date user information to build out recommendation systems. So I said it at the very beginning, I have a really cool announcement to make. So how many of you have worked with um, web set, website payments standard, the button sets, or with Express Checkout with PayPal in the past, or any PayPal product? Okay, a lot of you. So one of the things that we launched back in March in, in the US and have been working on is a complete overhaul to our API library. So essentially all the products out there we completely, they're still there, but we completely revised them. We built them on top of open standards. So, as of two nights ago, and announced officially this afternoon, REST APIs are available globally. These REST APIs are open standards, and I'll, sh I'll walk through the entire experience with you, built off of REST, built off of OAuth 2, for actually enabling payments through PayPal. Direct credit card payments will be available later in the year, but for right now, these PayPal payments in these new REST architecture is the future of PayPal. It's the future of everything we're doing. So the auth mechanism, you know, everything that I've written about in the past on, on auth, uh, authorization, authentication, all mechanisms like that 
are based off things like Open Standards Inc., OAuth 2, OpenID Connect. And we use an OAuth 2 mechanism for securing the applications. So if you've used any social mechanisms where you've had to log into another site or let's say log into Google or, or log into uh, to Yahoo, something like that, what you're familiar with is that user login step. This doesn't have it. So all we're doing is verifying that the application is valid. So it's a much easier behind the scenes flow. And when you get to direct credit card transactions near the end of the year, what you're going to see is you can do, build credit card processing into your application and never go through PayPal. The user does and never sees that PayPal is there. You're just pushing through direct credit card payments. And with built-in mechanisms in our mobile library for Card.io, now Card.io is a cool scanning technology where you take your credit card, take a picture of it with your smartphone using Card.io, and it inputs all your credit card details. So that's built into our mobile library as well. These are mechanisms that you can utilize now. Now I'm gonna go through all the raw curl examples, basically all the raw development examples that are language agnostic. But just know that there are many different software development kits out there for everything from uh, Node to PHP to Python, Java, .NET. These are all available on our GitHub account at github.com slash PayPal. Okay, first thing that you're gonna do is you need to collect the, uh, you need to collect that access token. So OAuth2, think of it like this. You, uh, when you sign up for an application on developer.paypal.com, you're given a client ID and a secret. Think of it like a revocable username and password, uh, and very anonymous. Now, when you have that information that you're passing through the OAuth2 flow, you eventually want to pass that through to get an access token. An access token is like a skeleton key to allow you to access all the other payment mechanisms. So the first thing that we do is authorize. We push through the OAuth2 flow. So you just make a, a curl HTTP POST request to this OAuth2 slash token endpoint. And if you use basic auth in the past where you're passing a username and a password through, it's the same thing. You have a client ID, a colon, and your secret passed through the user information, just like you would in basic auth. And what you get back, and what all of our mechanisms in the new REST API send back, is all JSON responses. So you get these really nice, tight experiences, very easy to parse through. So with the response that comes back, you get an access token. You extract that. Then, if you're familiar with Express Checkout, this flow will seem fairly similar. So what you're doing is making another HTTP POST request to this endpoint, payments, payment. You're passing through an authorization header, passing through that access token. And bearer right there is the token type. It will always be bearer. So you can put bearer and the access token. But the token type is sent back if you want to make it a little bit more future-proof, just in case it changes. Then your body, the body of your HTTP POST request that's coming back is really just a JSON object containing your intent, which is to make a sale your redirect URLs, which are your cancel, your success, uh, your, your fail, and then you're passing through that you're, pay, you're making a PayPal payment. And then you pay, say all the transaction details that the person's purchasing, how much the good costs. So then you just push that request through. Now this is actually where another, uh, another really cool mechanism of REST comes into play. How many of you have worked with REST APIs before? Okay, good. How many of you are familiar with Hadios? Okay, this is cool. Okay, this is gonna be fun. So what comes back in, the, in all of our responses from uh, our developer responses in the JSON object is a series of links that look like this. This is Hadios. Essentially, what it is, is a hypermedia constraint of REST. This response gives you all the next steps that you can take in the payment. So I, made, I, I initiated or created that payment. The next logical step for me would be to for the user to PayPal to log in and verify. There it is. The, ne the next logical step after that is to execute the payment. Right there. If I want to look up information about where I am, the self is right there. So you have the redirect of the approval of UI. You have the execute post request coming back. So the best thing about Hadios as a standard uh, is that it, re it sends back all the information that you need to make the next request. It sends back the HTTP request, uh, or, uh, request method. 
sends back the URI. It sends back the relevant content. So the next step that we're going to take is to push the user to that redirect URI. So they're going to log in or just accept the payment saying, yes, I verify that information. And then, a JSON, and then they're going to be forwarded back to the success URL. And the success header in the query string is going to be passed back a payer ID. Now, you store that, that execute. And then the next step you have to make is just make a request to that execute, passing through the authorization header again. And so you'll always pass that access token and just pass the payer ID. Done. That's your payment. The, when I wrapped the entire new PayPal REST library, it took me three hours. The heavy lift, and this is every feature that we have in there in the US. It's, it's direct credit card processing, PayPal processing, auth capture, every single mechanism that we offer within these new standards, three hours. When I first worked with a lot of the standards within, within PayPal, they do take a lot longer. They're more intricate. That, this is a way of streamlining for developers. And I'm really happy to see it's pushed globally now so that people can start working on it in different countries and with different experiences because you guys will all be developing different products and have different backgrounds than everyone else in, let's say, Canada or the US or the UK. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about is PayPal Mexico has a really great pro a partner program that you know, I think that a lot of the businesses can benefit from. A lot of the pro partner programs that we work with in PayPal um, offer benefits like, um, um, like cross-promotion or just helping you through your account details. So if you're working with PayPal, it's an amazing program to be a part of. And if you want your first steps with the REST APIs and working with all these new standards, go to the developer portal at developer.paypal.com. I've already verified in my, in, in my hotel room that this works in Mexico, so it will work. I guarantee it. So give it a shot, give us some feedback on it because we'd love to hear what, what you guys are using with it. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate the time. <laughs>